Hi, if you're interested in oriental rugs and other textiles and the cultures that made them past and present, RugTube is the place for you. We welcome collectors, dealers, aficionados, and maybe even scholars to talk about what's new, what's old, ideas, theories, and maybe even a bit of speculation here and there. We at RugTube know real art is the kind you can walk on. This evening, I'd like to say a few things about what could be described as Navajo rugs. Of course, to old-time dealers in Near Eastern textiles, particularly carpet dealers, Navajo rugs have something of a bad name. It's not hard to see why. This is a typical, although small, example of a Navajo. As can be seen, the wool quality seems fairly low, the wool seems kind of lumpy, and the design is simplistic. For someone used to pile textiles, what's also clear is that it is flat woven in that there is no pile, which means that it doesn't last very long. Also, given the fact that it's fairly loose in its weave, it's not going to last so long with heavy use. At the same time, the designs are oftentimes derivative. Or are they? This design is often credited as being a swastika design. Of course, it died out after the Second World War, but if we look into Navajo history, we realize that this is a flaming log design. It has its own mythology. It has nothing to do with the Nazis of the Second World War. With that, we can return to the whole issue of Navajo textiles. And the fact that we have Navajo textiles today is due to a lucky preservation. I'm reading from this book, Navajo Textile Arts, a very small book by H.P. Mera in 1948. But the author states clearly that it is pure luck that the textiles survive to the present time. I can read from his first chapter, and it's uh, a bit dated in, in its language, but we can understand exactly what he means. He's speaking of the 1890s, and he says, Two, the increasing ease with which white man's clothing and textiles were attainable spelled the ultimate doom for much of the hand-spun, hand-loom garments once deemed a necessity. This situation might well have held a threat for the continuance of Navajo weaving, except for a happy turn of events. At the very moment that fabricated apparel of Indian manufacture appeared to be on the way out, a demand for a woven floor covering had arisen. To supply this need, the Navajo, highly market conscious since very first, turned to the weaving of rugs. The change from weaving a textile designed for garments, susceptible of being draped, to that of a heavier and less flexible fabric was accomplished with little, if any, interruption in the activities of this craft. Put simply, a variety of factors led to the survival of this craft. First, we can say the Navajo themselves were eager and willing to trade for money. And second, the ease of transport at this time, which brought in clothing that uh, d damaged their own industry, also opened up new opportunities for them to make rugs. But before we go too much further, let me just start a little bit earlier and go through a bit of the history of Navajo weaving. Weaving plays a role in the Navajo creation myth. According to one tradition, Spider Woman instructed the women of the Navajo how to build the first loom. It's very clear from the very beginning of uh, studies devoted to Navajo textiles that 
they are studied as an anthropological phenomena rather than a fine art. This meant that the early books from the early 20th century anyway, fully integrate a study of the Navajo people with their art products. This is a little different from textiles from the Near East that appreciated them first and foremost as fine art. Navajo rugs and blankets have been traded for well over 150 years. Most of the earliest phase are from the earliest, earliest part of the 20th century and the reason is they are so susceptible to wear. Towards the end of the 19th century, weavers began to make rugs for tourism and export. Typical Navajo textiles have strongly geometric patterns and they can be influenced from Near Eastern sources. A good example of that is the Caucasian octagonal motif. In Navajo weaving, the slit weaving technique is not used. This is where the uh, foundation is discontinuous. In a Navajo weaving, the warps go all through the textile. It's unclear exactly when the Navajo began weaving, and the reasons are not hard to fathom there are cultural changes that archaeologists can see, but archaeologists can't determine when a language group arrived. Uh, it's clear that before the Navajo arrived in their southwestern home, there were Pueblo Indians who were there. The Pueblos were known for making very complicated, very beautiful textiles. Some of these have survived and murals have survived. These date to about 1000 AD. Some experts contend that the, that the Navajo were not major weavers until the 17th century. However, history says that this is not likely the case, that the Navajo were most likely trading textiles and other things well before the 17th century. They obtained cotton through local trade routes before the arrival of the Spanish. After the arrival of the Spanish, they began to use wool. The Pueblo and Navajo were not generally on friendly terms, but many Pueblo sought refuge with the Navajo neighbors in the late 17th century to evade the conquistadors in the aftermath of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. In the late 17th century, the Navajo acquired the Iberian Chura, a breed of sheep from Spanish explorers. These animals were developed into a unique breed today called the Navajo Churro. These sheep produced a useful long staple wool. In other words, this is easy to spin by hand. The best Navajo textiles are still woven from long staple wool. But the story of this is a little bit more complicated, and I'll leave that until a bit later. Few remnants of 18th century Navajo weaving survive. The most important surviving examples come from Massacre Cave at Canyon de Chelly, Arizona. In 1804, a group of Navajo were shot and killed there. About a hundred years later, a local trader named Sam Day retrieved the textiles, which was sold to many museums. The majority of Massacre Cave blankets feature plain stripes, yet some exhibit the terraces and diamonds characteristic of later Navajo weaving. Commerce expanded after the Santa Fe Trail opened in 1822, and greater number, numbers of examples of Navajo textiles survive from this period. Until 1880, all such examples were blankets as opposed to rugs. In 1850, these highly prized trade items sold for reputedly $50 in gold. That was a huge sum at that time, adjusting for inflation and particularly considering the fact that in the West, gold was very hard won. Prior to the mid 19th century, Navajo weaving coloration was mostly natural brown, white, and indigo. 
indigo dye was obtained through trade. By the late 19th century, the palette has expanded to include red, black, green, yellow, and gray. Now, of course, Navajo textiles are perhaps best known for their red, and there's a very good reason for this. Red was the most difficult dye to obtain locally. Early Navajo textiles used cochineal obtained from traded textiles, and the yarn could be unraveled from these textiles and used in the local textiles. The Navajo obtained black dye through pinion pitch and ashes, and it's clear that for the Navajo black dye, unlike many Near Eastern blacks, it doesn't cause damage to the wool. After railroad service began in the early 1880s, aniline dyes became available in bright shades of red, orange, green, purple, and yellow. Mid-19th century Navajo rugs often used a three-ply yarn called Saxony, which refers to high-quality, naturally dyed, silky yarns. Red tones in Navajo rugs of this period come either from Saxony or from a raveled cloth known in Spanish as Bayeta, which was a woolen manufacturer from England. With the arrival of the railroad in the early 1880s, another machine-produced yarn came into use in Navajo weaving, the four-ply aniline dyed yarn known as Germantown, because the yarn was manufactured in Pennsylvania. A number of these rugs have such wild colors and designs that they are almost unidentifiable as being Navajo products. Among the locally produced yarns for Navajo textiles, indiscriminate breeding from 1870 to 1890 caused a steady decline in wool quality. This was particularly a low quality wool in terms of its flexibility. It contained too much camp and was very brittle, not suitable for use in a textile that would receive wear. In 1903, federal agents attempted to address the problem by introducing Rambouillet rams, but the wool was less suitable for hand spinning. From 1920 to 1940, the Navajo rugs characteristically have a curly wool and sometimes a knotty or lumpy appearance. This is roughly the time period where most of the collectible Navajo rugs, the old Navajo rugs, are from 1920 to 1940. This goes some way in explaining why the old Near Eastern rug dealers looked down upon Navajo products. The Southwestern Range and Sheep Breeding Laboratory, founded in 1935, developed a new sheep bloodline that simulated the wool characteristics of the 19th century Navajo churro stock and would supply adequate meat at the same time. Modern Navajo rugs, therefore, have very good wool. It's interesting in that old rugs continue to go for a premium. Some indication of this transition is seen in some of the early books on Navajo. The, Nav the Navajo and His Blanket by U.S. Hollister states, I have traveled extensively throughout our southern country and have examined the stocks of nearly every Indian trader and dealer in Navajo fabrics. And in no instance has a spurious blanket or rug been offered to me as of Navajo make. What, what exactly does he mean by spurious? He defines a little bit more here. The Navajos often prefer to wear blankets made in the East, as in made by mechanical looms, not of local manufacture, for two reasons. One is that they are lighter, and the other, that they can sell a good blanket of their own make for a sum significant to purchase a Mackinac. Not long ago, a lady visitor saw one of these Mackinac blankets 
on the back of a Navajo buck at Gallup, New Mexico. She immediately began negotiations and finally got the blanket for about three times what it cost. She went away rejoicing, believing she had a genuine Navajo blanket. Why? Because she had bought it from a Navajo Indian. This was writing from 1903, and this makes it clear from a technical standpoint. From the standpoint of use, the blankets woven further east were even preferred by the Navajo. This means that the blankets had more value than utility. This means that they were appreciated, even at a very early date, not as utilitarian items, but as items of trade, of items of novelty. I'll read next from this book, Indian Blankets and Their Makers by George Wharton James. This is from 1914. And we read one of the reasons why Navajo blankets or floor coverings were inferior. To hasten on the manufacture of more blankets, therefore, the traders themselves introduced a cotton warp which they sold at a low price to the Indian. Thus relieved of the trouble and labor of making wool warps, blankets were made much easier and therefore cheaper than before, and speedily a great demand was created for cheap blankets. Urged on to greater productiveness, the Indian failed to clean the wool. They had neither the time properly to scour and wash it, remove the burrs, nor extract the dirt, dust, and grease. Again, we're talking about rugs that today would be regarded as at least semi-antiques. It's interesting to note that, again, the old-time Near Eastern dealers probably had a good point. The Navajo of that period, technologically, were inferior. However, as collectible objects, in many cases, they could be far in excess of what you could achieve in terms of price for a similarly sized Near Eastern textile. There's a bias even now towards local Indian or Native American products. Why should this be? Perhaps some of it is the notion that the Native Americans embody a tradition that's easy to understand, a, a pre-modern tradition, whereas many people would say that the Near Eastern textiles from a culture far, far away are more difficult to comprehend. Whatever the case, I hope that people will continue to study American textiles with the same interest as they did before. They're in great need of serious study, and particularly because many of the Near Eastern lands are off limits, they offer a perfect opportunity to come to grips with material culture without a long plane journey. Thank you very much.